and welcome to Electric Goddess's YouTube channel. My name is Jill and I'm Technical Director here at Electric Goddess. In this video, I'll review the best practices to set up your EIS or Electrochemical Impedance Spectroscopy Experiment. We want to help you get the most accurate results. Before we begin, I just want to say if you want to learn more about how EIS works, I encourage you to follow the links in the description below where I list out a few videos as reference for you. In this video, we're focused on tips for how to improve the accuracy of your EIS measurements. This includes how to eliminate noise from your EIS data and how to use the right type of EIS for your system. Then I'll do a demonstration on Squidward, our Admiral Instruments SquidStat Plus electrochemical workstation. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below or visit Electric Goddess's website and contact us through the form. We provide a free first consultation. Links to all of this and more will be in the description below. When we're setting up an EIS experiment, there's a few things to pay particular attention to to make sure that you get the most accurate results. You can see here I have SquidStat already connected to a series of alligator clips that will be fastened to our battery. Squidward also has these ports in the back. It has the USB to connect to your computer and this power cable. It's a seamless integration with the software provided by Admiral Instruments so that when you just plug in with USB from your electrochemical workstation to your computer, it syncs and it's ready to collect data. Since in this demo today, we are going to be using lithium ion batteries in the cylindrical format in 18650, I have it here in a battery fixture or holder. This fixture is great to analyze data because you have gold contacts, which decreases any kind of resistances between the leads and your battery. It's specially designed for accurate results. As you're setting up, one of the things to particularly pay attention to is what are your cables like and how are they going to be interfering with the signal? As current passes through wires, it creates a magnetic field that can then interact with the current of another wire. To reduce any of those capacitive or inductive effects, you can wind cables together like this. Winding or twisting cables together is a great way to reduce any capacitive or inductive effects. This is because in the space between two wires, carrying current in opposite directions, the magnetic field compounds. It's additive. Twisting it reduces the magnetic field to zero. Higher current produces an even higher magnetic field, so it's important when using high currents to do something like this. There's other benefits to this too, and I've provided a resource in the description below if you'd like to read more. The second consideration that you want to take into account is whether to use a two-wire or four-wire measurement. Before we get into the difference between two-wire and four-wire measurements and when you should use each one, I just want to point out what each of these leads are. What's great is on the Admiral Instruments SquidStat Plus on the top, you have a labeling of what each is in case you forget or it's in the manual. So let's go through it really quick. For the red terminal with the black coating, this is the working electrode. For the black terminal with the black coating, that's the counter electrode. The ones that are coated with white are the working electrode sense and the counter electrode sense with the black. And then the one that's black with the green is the reference electrode. And so wherever this reference electrode is clipped to will be read as zero volts or zero potential and then it'll counter it'll measure the working and counter electrode relative to that zero point there's two wire measurements three wire four wire and five wire measurements but for a battery which has two terminals the positive and negative we're just going to be talking about two wire and four wire measurements for the two wire measurement, you want to stack the sense electrode with the corresponding electrode, whether it be the working electrode or the counter electrode with the sense electrode on the outside. Then you want to attach the black clips, the counter electrode to the negative terminal with the reference electrode and connect the red electrode or the working electrode with the positive terminal. The difference between the two wire and four wire measurement is pretty simple for this instrumentation and configuration. You just want to disconnect the working sense electrode from the working electrode and clip that onto a separate lead for the sense. It'll still remain connected to the positive terminal. 
The benefit to a four wire versus a two wire system is that in a four wire, it's great for any kind of system where your impedance is less than one kilo ohm. When you're using a two wire measurement, it's actually more resistance in your system versus a four wire measurement. And so the four wire reduces those contact resistances with your cell. As current flows through the wire, it causes a voltage drop. So in a two wire measurement, you're measuring both the current and voltage at the same point. So you get that extra voltage drop. In a four probe system, your voltage sense is separate from your current sense, and so you don't pick up that extra drop in voltage. That voltage drop is inconsequential in your data. Now let me connect these and I'll show you in a demonstration how you can actually get more resistance in a two wire versus a four wire system. The first demo that I'll show you is of the two wire measurement. You could see that I have the 18650 lithium ion battery wired up in the cell holder to the two wire measurement. Notice how the sense leads are outside of the working electrode and counter electrode leads and the reference electrode is tied with the negative terminal in the black wire. Now that I have this set up, I can start the experiment. And our experiment is running. As you can see, that impedance is being mapped on the Nyquist plot. And the particular area that we wanna pay attention to is where the impedance first crosses the x-axis. So where the imaginary impedance is at zero, and then the only impedance that we're measuring is the purely resistive component of that impedance. Now we can zoom in on that point and see where it is. And from this result, it looks like the where it crosses the x-axis is around 0 0.03 ohms perhaps closer to 0 0.034, 0 0.033, around there. Now we can stop this experiment a little bit early because we already have the data that we need. And now we want to rewire this configuration for a four wire measurement. The only thing we want to do is just disconnect that sense electrode and connect it to that extra red lead there. When your battery is wired in a four electrode measurement, it should look something like this. You have the four leads connected to the four wires. In the case where your battery just has tabs, you want these four alligator clips or leads connected onto the tab. That's right, two alligator clips per tab. Now we can run this experiment, and here we've started the experiment. We're collecting that impedance data on the Nyquist plot for the four wire measurement. And now that we've seen it's crossed the x-axis, we can zoom in. And we can see where that impedance crosses the x-axis or the real axis, real impedance axis, and the imaginary impedance goes to zero is around 0 0.02 ohms, maybe a little closer to 0 0.022 ohms. And here we have a graph comparing the data we just acquired on the two wire versus four wire measurement. As you can see in red is the two wire measurement which has a much higher initial resistance or solution resistance there recorded versus the four wire measurement, which has less initial resistance. Even though you have the same shape of the curve, the same data, that resistance is offset because you have extra resistance in the circuit itself. That voltage drop is present. Once you determine whether you're using a two wire versus four wire measurement, you'll wanna connect those alligator clips to the leads of the cell holder. I have these leads wrapped in parafilm just to, for safety reasons, because if they touch, they will shock. And that can not just shock me, but also shock the battery, which I don't, I don't want the battery to short. For a cell holder like this, it's fairly easy to connect the alligator clips. You simply wanna make sure that they're in contact with the lead, and I like to press down extra hard to make sure that they're making that electrical contact. When it comes to a battery like a pouch cell though, you'll have actual foil tabs protruding from the cell that you'll want to attach the alligator clip to. A couple tricks with this are to make sure that the tabs are folded over and not kept very long and really press firmly on the alligator clip to make sure that it's sinking its teeth into that tab and making that electrical contact. If you're having any issues with contact with the alligator clips, 
You'll want to make sure that you're not having any kind of rust or corrosion on the terminals. And if there is any kind of rust or oxidation, you could take sandpaper and sand it down a little bit to expose some of that fresh metallic surface and remove that oxide layer. Another tip to reduce any kind of electromagnetic interference with your experiment is to surround it in a Faraday cage. This Faraday cage can shield it from electrical pickup or electrical radiation. For instance, if your EIS experiment isn't in this isolated conference room like mine is and is instead in a busy lab with lots of wires and experiments going on all over the place, those other experiments can actually interfere with the data that you're getting with your system. It can cause noise or inductive loops in your EIS data. Faraday cages can be a great tool to further shield your equipment from that interference. And remember to ground your Faraday cage. There is a grounding port on the back of the Squidstat Plus. Or you can use your own ground. Once you have your potentiostat set up, your battery set up, the alligator leads connected to your battery holder or your battery tabs, it's time to set up the software and select which EIS type you're going to use for your system. There's two types of EIS. There's GEIS or galvanostatic electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And there's also PEIS, which is potentiostatic electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. The basic difference between them is that in GEIS, you're setting the current, while for PEIS, you're setting the voltage. And I have a video specifically on this, and you'll wanna check that out to learn more about the difference between those two techniques. For batteries, since they are a low impedance system, we typically want to use GEIS. To summarize, today we reviewed some helpful tips to make sure that you are getting accurate results from your EIS data, which can honestly be pretty tricky to get. You wanna make sure that EIS data is free from any noise, accurate, and representative of your sample, whether that may be a battery or something else. So remember to wind those wires and use Faraday cages and make sure those alligator clips are fi fastened tight on those leads or on those battery terminals. Make sure you're selecting GEIS for your battery in most cases and use those four wire measurements over two wire measurements to make sure you're not getting added resistance or impedance in your data. Especially if your battery is a low impedance system, less than 1000 ohms. As a reminder, a lot more information is available in the description below by following the links. If you want any help with setting up your test plans or EIS data collection, Electric Audis is here to help. Feel free to contact us through our website. If you enjoyed learning with us, like this video and subscribe to our Electric Goddess YouTube channel. That way you can be notified of our next video. Thanks for watching fellow cosmic beings. See you next time.